She streamed color and flapped in layers. She was an angry witch, not a happy one. She was fierce, not a fairy, after all, but a demon. She did run fast, as fast as a child, although she was a wrinkled woman, an outburst that jumped at us from bushes, between cars, between buildings. We children vowed that we would never run home if she came after one of us. No matter what she did to us, we had to run in the opposite direction from home. We didn't want her to know where we lived. If we couldn't outrun her and lose her, we'd die alone. Once she spotted my sister in our yard, opened the gate and chased her up the stairs. My sister screamed and cried, hanging on the door. Our mother let her in quickly, looking frightened as she fumbled at the latches to lock out Piana. My sister had to be chanted out of her screaming. It was a good thing Piana had a short memory, because she did not find our house again. Sometimes when a bunch of tools and reeds and grasses mixed and blew and waved, I was terrified that it was she, that she was carrying them or parting them. One day we realized that we had not seen her for a while. We forgot her, never seeing her again. She had probably been locked up in the crazy house too. I had invented a quill pen out of a peacock feather, but stopped writing with it when I saw that it waved like a one-eyed slough plant. I thought every house had to have its crazy woman or crazy girl, every village its idiot. Who would be it at our house? Probably me. My sister did not start talking among non-family until a year after I started, but she was neat while I was messy, my hair tangled and dusty. My dirty hands broke things. Also, I had had the mysterious illness, and there were adventurous people inside my head to whom I talked. With them, I was frivolous and violent, orphaned. I was white and had red hair, and I rode a white horse. Once when I realized how often I went away to see these free movies, I asked my sister, just checking to see if hearing voices and motors and seeing cowboy movies on blank walls was normal. I asked, uh, trying to be casual. Do you talk to people that aren't real inside your mind? Do I what? She said. Never mind, I said fast. Never mind, nothing. My sister, my almost twin, the person most like me in all the world, had said, What? I had vampire nightmares. Every night, the fangs grew longer, and my angel wings turned pointed and black. I hunted humans down in the long woods and shadowed them with my blackness. Tears dripped from my eyes, but blood dripped from my fangs, blood of the people I was supposed to love. I did not want to be our crazy one. Quite often, the big loud women came shouting into the house, Now when you sell this one, I'd like to buy her to be my maid. Then they laughed. They always said that about my sister, not me, because I dropped dishes at them. I picked my nose while I was cooking and serving. My clothes were wrinkled even though we owned a laundry. Indeed, I was getting stranger every day. I affected a limp, and of course the mysterious disease I had had might have been dormant and contagious. But if I made myself unsellable here, my parents need only wait until China, and there, where anything happens, they would be able to unload us. Even me, sellable, marriageable. So while the adults wept over the letters about the neighbors gone berserk during communists, they do funny dances, they sing weird songs, just syllables, they make us dance, they make us sing, I was secretly glad. As long as the aunts kept disappearing and the uncles dying after unspeakable tortures, my parents would prolong their gold mountain stay. We could start spending our fair money on a car and chairs, a stereo. 
Nobody wrote to tell us that Mao himself had been matched to an older girl where he was a child and that he was freeing women from prisons where they had been put for refusing the businessmen their parents had picked as husbands. Nobody told us that the revolution, the liberation, was against girl slavery and girl infanticide, a village-wide party if it's a boy. Girls would no longer have to kill themselves rather than get married. May the communists light up the house on a girl's birthday. I watched our parents buy a sofa, then a rug, curtains, chairs to replace the orange and apple crates one by one, now to be used for storage. Good. At the beginning of the second communist five-year plan, our parents bought a car, but you could see the relatives and the villagers getting more and more worried about what to do with the girls. We had three girl second cousins, no boys. Their great-grandfather and our grandfather were brothers. The great-grandfather was the old man who lived with them, as the river pirate great-uncle was the old man who lived with us. When my sisters and I ate at their house, there we would be, six girls eating. The old man opened his eyes wide at us and turned in a circle, surrounded. His neck tendons stretched out. Maggots, he shouted. Maggots! Where are my grandsons? I want grandsons! Give me grandsons, maggots! He pointed at each one of us. Maggot, 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 maggot. Then he dived into his food, eating fast and getting seconds. Eat maggots, he said. Look at the maggots chew. He does that at every meal, the girl told us in English. Yeah, we said. Our old man hates us too. What assholes. Third granduncle finally did get a boy, though. His only great-grandson. The boy's parents and the old man bought him toys, bought him everything. New diapers, new plastic pants, not homemade di diapers, not bread bags. They gave him a full, a full month party, inviting all the emigrant villagers. They deliberately hadn't given the girls parties so that no one would notice another girl. Their brother got toy trucks that were big enough to climb inside. When we grew older, he got a bicycle and let the girls play with his old tricycle and wagon. My mother bought his sisters a typewriter. They can be clerk typists, their father kept saying, but he would not buy them a typewriter. What an asshole, I said, muttering the way my father muttered dog vomit when the customers nagged him about missing socks. Maybe my mother was afraid that I'd say things like that out loud and so had cut my tongue. Now again, plans were urgently afoot to fix me up, to improve my voice. The wealthiest villager wife came to the, to the laundry one day to have a listen. You better do something with this one, she told my mother. She has an ugly voice. She quacks like a pressed duck. Then she looked at me unnecessarily hard. Chinese do not have to address children directly. You have what we call a press duck voice, she said. This woman was the giver of American names, a powerful namer, though it was American names. My parents gave the Chinese names, and she was right. If you squeeze the duck hung up to dry in the east window, the sound that was my voice would come out of it. She was a woman of such power that all we immigrants and descendants of immigrants were obliged to have to her family forever for bringing us here and for finding us jobs, and she had named my voice. No, I quacked. No, I don't. Don't talk back, my mother scolded. Maybe this lady was powerful enough to send us back. I went to the front of the laundry and worked so hard that I impolitely did not take notice of her leaving. Improve that voice, she had instructed my mother, or else you'll never marry her off. Even the fool half-ghosts won't have her. 
So I discovered the next plan to get rid of us. Marry us off here without waiting until China. The villagers' peasant minds converged on marriage. Late at night, when we walked home from the laundry, they should have been sleeping behind locked doors, not overflowing into the streets in front of the benevolent associations, all lit. We stood on tiptoes and on one another's shoulders, and through the door we saw spotlights open on tall singers of fire with sequins. An opera from San Francisco, an opera from Hong Kong. Usually, I did not understand the words in operas, whether because of our obscure dialect or theirs, I didn't know. But I heard one line sung out into the night air in a woman's voice, high and clear as ice. She was standing on a chair and she sang, Beat me, then beat me. The crowd laughed until the tears rolled down their cheeks while the cymbals clashed. The dragon's copper laugh and the drums banged like firecrackers. She is playing the part of a new daughter-in-law, my mother explained. Beat me, then beat me, she sang again and again. It must have been a refrain each time she sang it. The audience broke up laughing. Men laughed, women laughed. They were having a great time. Chinese smeared bad daughters-in-law with honey and tied them naked on top of ant nests, my father said. A husband may kill a wife who disobeys him. Confucius said that, Confucius the rational man. The singer, I thought, sounded like me talking, yet everyone said, Oh, beautiful, beautiful, when she sang hi. Walking home, the noisy women shook their old heads and sang a folk song that made them laugh uproariously. Marry a rooster, follow a rooster. Marry a dog, follow a dog. Married to a cudgel, married to a pestle, be faithful to it, follow it. I learned that young men were placing ads in the Gold Mountain News to find wives when my mother and father started answering them. Suddenly, a series of new workers showed up at the laundry. They each worked for a week before they disappeared. They ate with us. They talked Chinese with my parents. They did not talk to us. We were to call them elder brother, although they were not related to us. They were all funny-looking FOBs, fresh off the boats, as the Chinese-American kids at school called the young immigrants. Fobs wear high-riding gray slacks, and white shirts with the sleeves rolled up. Their eyes do not focus correctly, shifty-eyed, and they hold their mouths slack, not tight-jawed masculine. They shave off their sideburns. The girls said they'd never date an FOB. My mother took one home from the laundry, and I saw him looking over our photographs. This one, he said, picking up my sister's picture. No, no, said my mother. This one, my picture. The oldest first, she said. Good, I was an obstacle. I would protect my sister and myself at the same time. As my parents and the FOB sat talking at the kitchen table, I dropped two dishes. I found my walking stick and limped across the floor. I twisted my mouth and caught my hand in the knots of my hair. I spilled soup on the fob when I handed him his bowl. She can sew, though, I heard my mother say, and sweep. I raised dust swirls sweeping around and under the fob's chair. Very bad luck because spirits live inside the broom. I put on my shoes with the open flaps and flapped about like a wino ghost. From then on, I wore those shoes to parties whenever the mothers gathered to talk about marriages. The fob and my parents paid me no attention, half ghosts, half invisible, and when he left, my mother yelled at me about the dry duck voice, the bad temper, the laziness, the clumsiness, the stupidity that comes from reading too much. The young men stopped visiting. No one came back. Couldn't you just stop rubbing your nose? She scolded. All the village ladies are talking about your nose. They're afraid to eat our pa pastries because you might have kneaded the dough. 
but I couldn't stop at will anymore, and a crease developed across the bridge. My parents would not give up, though. Though you can't see it, my mother said, a red string around your ankle ties you to the person you'll marry. He's already been born, and he's on the other end of the string. At Chinese school, there was a mentally retarded boy who followed me around, probably believing that we were two of a kind. He had an enormous face, and he growled. He laughed from so far within his thick body that his face got confused about what the sounds coming up into his mouth might be, laughs or cries. He barked unhappily. He didn't go to classes but hung around the playgrounds. We suspected he was not a boy but an adult. He wore baggy khaki trousers like a man's. He carried bags of toys for giving to certain children. Whatever you wanted, he'd get it for you. Brand new toys, as many as you could think up in your poverty. All the toys you never had when you were younger. We wrote lists, discussed our lists, compared them. Those kids not in his favor gave lists to those who were. Where do you get the toys? I asked. I own stores, he roared, one word at a time, thick-tongued. At recess the day after ordering, we got handed out to us coloring books, paint sets, model kits. But sometimes he chased us, his fat arms out to the side, his fat fingers opening and closing, his legs stiff like Frankenstein's monster, like the mummy dragging its foot, growling, laughing, crying. Then we'd have to run, following the old rule, running away from our house. But suddenly he knew where we worked. He found us. Maybe he had followed us in his wanderings. He started sitting at our laundry. Many of the storekeepers invited sitting in their stores, but we did not have sitting because the laundry was hot and because it was outside Chinatown. He sweated. He panted, the stubble rising and falling on his fat neck and chin. He sat on two large cartons that he brought with him and stacked one on top of the other. He said, Hello to my mother and father, and then balancing his heavy head, he lowered himself carefully onto his his cartons and sat. My parents allowed this. They did not chase him out or comment about how strange he was. I stopped placing orders for toys. I didn't limp anymore. My parents would only figure that this zombie and I were a match. I studied hard, got straight A's, but nobody seemed to see that I was smart and had nothing in common with this monster, this birth defect. At school, there was dating and dances, but not for good Chinese girls. You ought to develop yourself socially as well as mentally, the American teachers who took me aside said. I told nobody about the monster, and nobody else was talking either. No mention about the laundry workers who appeared and disappeared. No mention about the sitter. Maybe I was making it all up, and queer marriage notions did not occur to other people. I had better not say a word then. Don't give them ideas. Keep quiet. I pressed clothes, baskets of giants, BVDs, long underwear even in summertime, t-shirts, sweatshirts. Laundry work is men's clothes, unmarried men's clothes. My back felt sick because it was toward the monster who gave away toys. His lumpishness was sending out germs that would lower my IQ. His leechiness was drawing IQ points out of the back of my head. I maneuvered my work shifts so that my brothers would work the afternoons when he usually came lumbering into the laundry, but he caught on and began coming during the evening, the cool shift. Then I would switch back to the afternoon or to the early mornings on weekends and in summer, dodging him. I kept my sister with me, protecting her without telling her why. If she hadn't noticed that I mustn't scare her. Let's clean house this morning, I'd say. Our other sister was a baby and the brothers were not in danger. But the war person would stalk down our street. His thick face smiled between the lettering on the laundry window and when he saw me working, he shouldered and sighed. At night, I thought, I heard his feet dragging around the house, scraping gravel. I sat up to listen to our watchdog prowl the yard, pulling her long chain after her, and that worried me, too. 
I had to do something about that chain, the weight of it scraping her neck for sure. And if she was walking about, why wasn't she barking? Maybe somebody was out there taming her with raw meat. I could not ask for help. Every day, the Hulk took one drink from the water cooler and went once to the bathroom, stumbling between the presses into the back of the laundry, big shoes clumping. Then my parents would talk about what could do, what could be inside his boxes. Were they filled with toys, with money? When the toilet flushed, they stopped talking about it, but one day, he either stayed in the bathroom for a long time or went for a walk and left the boxes unguarded. Let's open them up, my, said my mother, and she did. I looked over her shoulder. The two cartons were stuffed with pornography, naked magazines, nudie postcards, and photographs. You would think she'd have thrown him out right then, but my mother said, My goodness, he's not too stupid to want to find out about women. I heard the old women talk about how he was stupid but very rich. Maybe because I was the one with the tongue cut loose, I had grown inside me a list of over 200 things that I had to tell my mother so that she would know the true things about me and to stop the pain in my throat. When I first started counting, I had had only 36 items. How I had prayed for a white horse of my own, white, the bad, mournful color, the prayer bringing me to the attention of the God of the black and white nuns, who gave us holy cards in the park. How I wanted the horse to start the movies in my mind coming true. How I had picked on a girl and made her cry. How I had stolen from the cash register and bought candy for everybody I knew, not just brothers and sisters, but strangers too, and ghost children. How it was me who pulled up the onions in the garden out of anger. How I had jumped head first off the dresser, not accidentally, but so I could fly. Then there were my fights at Chinese school and the nuns who kept stopping us in the park, which was across the street from Chinese school, to tell us that if we didn't get baptized, we'd go to, the, to hell, like one of the nine Taoist hells forever. And the obscene caller that phoned us at home when the adults were at the laundry and the Mexican and Filipino girls at school who went to confession and how I envied them their white dresses and their chance each Saturday to tell even thoughts that were sinful. If only I could let my mother know the list, she and the world would become more like me, and I would never be alone again. I would pick a time of day when my mother was alone and tell her one item a day. I'll be finished in less than a year. If the telling got excruciating and her anger too bad, I'd tell five items once a week like, a, like the Catholic girls, and I'd still be through in a year, maybe ten months. My mother's most peaceful time was in the evenings when she starched the white shirts. The laundry would be clean, the gray wood floors sprinkled and swept with water and wet sawdust. She would be wringing shirts at the starched tub and not running about. My father and sisters and brothers could be at their own jobs mending, folding, packaging. Steam would be rising from the starch, the air cool at last. Yes, that would be the time and place for the telling. And I wanted to ask again why the women in our family have a split nail on our left little toe. Whenever we asked our parents about it, they would glance at each other embarrassed. I think I've heard one of them say, she didn't get away. I made up that we are descended from an ancestress who stubbed her toe and fell when running from a rapist. I wanted to ask my mother if I had guessed right. I hunkered down between the wall and the wicker basket of shirts. I had decided to start with the earliest item when I had smashed a spider against the white side of the house. It was the first thing I killed. I said clearly, I killed a spider, and it was nothing. She did not hit me or throw hot starch at me. It sounded like nothing to me, too. How strange when I had had such feelings of death shoot through my hand and into my body so that I would surely die. So I had to continue, of course, and let her know how important it had been. I returned every day to look at its smear on the side of the house, I said. It was our old house, the one we lived in until I was five. I went to the wall every day to look. I studied the stain. 
Relieved because she said nothing but only continued squeezing the starch, I went away feeling pretty good. Just 206 more items to go. I moved carefully all the next day so as not to do anything or have anything happen to me that would make me go back to 207 again. I tell a couple of easy ones and work up to how I had pulled the quiet girl's hair and how I had enjoyed the year being sick. If it was going to be this easy, maybe I could blurt out several a day. Maybe an easy one and a hard one. I could go chronologically. Or I could work from easy to hard or hard to easy, depending on my mood. On the second night, I talked about how I had hinted to a ghost girl that I wished I had a doll of my own until she gave me a head and a body to glue together, that she hadn't given it to me of her own generosity, but because I had hinted. But on the fifth night, I skipped two to reward myself. I decided it was time to do a really hard one and tell her about the white horse. And suddenly the duck voice came out, which I did not use with the family. What's it called, mother? The duck voice coming out talking to my own mother. When a person whispers to the head of the sages, no, not the sages, more like the Buddhas, but not real people like the Buddhas. They've always lived in the sky and never turned into people like the Buddhas. And you whisper to them, the boss of them, and ask for things. They're like magicians. What do you call it when you talk to the boss magician? Talking to the top magician, I guess. I did that. Yes, that's it. That's what I did. I talked to the top magician magician, and asked for a white horse. There, said. Mmm, she said, squeezing the starch out of the collar and cuffs. But I had talked and she acted as if she hadn't heard. Perhaps she hadn't understood. I had to be more explicit. I hated this. I kneeled on the bed in there in the laundry room and put my arms up like I saw. In a comic book, one night I heard monsters coming through the kitchen and I had promised the god in the movies, the one the Mexicans and Filipinos have, as in God Bless America, that I would not read comic books anymore if he would save me just once. I had broken that promise and I needed to tell all this to my mother too and in that ludicrous position asked for a horse. Mmm, she said, nodded and kept dipping and squeezing. On my two nights off... I had sat on the floor, too, but had not said a word. Mother, I whispered and quacked. I can't stand this whispering, she said, looking right at me, stopping her squeezing. Senseless gabbings every night. I wish it would stop. Go away and work. Whispering, whispering, making no sense. Madness. I don't feel like hearing your craziness. So I had to stop, relieved in some ways. I shut my mouth. But I felt something alive tearing at my throat, bite by bite, from the inside. Soon there would be three hundred things and too late to get them out before my mother grew old and died. I had probably interrupted her in the middle of her own quiet time when the boiler and presses were off and the cool night flew against the windows and moths and crickets. Very few customers came in, starching. The shirts for the next day's pressing was probably my mother's time to ride off with the people in her own mind. That would explain why she was so far away and did not want to listen to me. Leave me alone, she said. The Hulk, the hunching sitter, brought a third box now to rest his feet on. He patted his boxes. He sat in wait, hunching on his pile of dirt. My throat hurt constantly, vocal cords taut to snapping. One night when the laundry was so busy that the whole family was eating dinner there, crowded around the little round table, my throat burst open. I stood up, talking and burbling. I looked directly at my mother and at my father and screamed, I want you to tell that Hulk, that gorilla ape, to go away and never bother us again. I know what you're up to. You're thinking he's rich and we're poor. You think we're odd and not pretty and we're not bright. You think you can give us away to freaks. You better not do that, mother. I don't want to see him or his dirty boxes here tomorrow. If I see him here one more time, I'm going away. I'm going away anyway. I am. Do you hear me? I may be ugly and clumsy, but one thing I'm not, I'm not retarded. There's nothing wrong with my brain. Do you know what the teacher goes to say about me? 
They tell me I'm smart and I can win scholarships. I can get into colleges. I've already applied. I'm smart. I can do all kinds of things. I know how to get A's. And they say I could be a scientist or a mathematician if I want. I can make a living and take care of myself. So you don't have to find me a keeper who's too dumb to know a bad bar bargain. I'm so smart. If they say write 10 pages, I can write 15. I can do ghost things even better than ghosts can. Not everybody thinks I'm nothing. I am not going to be a slave or a wife. Even if I am stupid and talk funny and get sick, I won't let you turn me into a slave or a wife. I'm getting out of here. I can't stand living here anymore. It's your fault I talk weird. The only reason I flunked kindergarten was because you couldn't teach me English and you gave me a zero IQ. I've brought my IQ up, though. They say I'm smart now. Things follow in lines at school. They take stories and teach us to turn them into essays. I don't need anybody to pronounce English words for me. I can figure them out by myself. I'm going to get scholarships, and I'm going away. And at college, I'll have the people I like for friends. I don't care if their great-great-grandfather died of TB. I don't care if they were our enemies in China 4,000 years ago. So get that ape out of here. I'm going to college, and I'm not going to Chinese school anymore. I'm going to run for office at American school, and I'm going to join clubs. I'm going to get enough offices and clubs on my record to get into college, and I can't stand Chinese school anyway. The kids are rowdy and mean, fighting all night, and I don't want to listen to any more of your stories. They have no logic. They scramble me up. You lie with stories. You won't tell me a story and then say, this is a true story, or this is just a story. I can't tell the difference. I don't even know what your real names are. I can't tell what's real and what's made up. Ha! You can't stop me from talking. You tried to cut off my tongue, but it didn't work. So I told the hardest 10 or 12 things on my list all in one outburst. My mother, who is champion talker, was, of course, shouting at the same time. I cut it to make you talk more, not less, you dummy. You're still stupid. You can't listen right. I didn't say I was going to marry you off. Did I ever say that? Did I ever mention that? Those newspaper people were for your sister, not you. Who would want you? Who said we could sell you? We can't sell people. Can't you take a joke? You can't even tell a joke from real life. You're not so smart. Can't even tell real from false. I'm never getting married. Never! Who'd want you to marry you? Who would want to marry you anyway? Noise, noisy, talking like a duck, disobedient, messy, and I know about college. What makes you think you're the first one to think about college? I was a doctor. I went to medical school. I don't see why you have to be a mathematician. I don't see why you can't be a doctor like me. I can't stand fever and delirium or listening to people coming out of anesthesia. But I didn't say I wanted to be a mathematician either. That's what the ghosts say. I want to be a lumberjack and a newspaper reporter. Might as well tell her some of the other items on my list. I'm going to chop down trees in the daytime and write about timber at night. I don't see why you need to go to college at all to become either one of those things. Everybody else is sending their girls to typing school. Learn to type if you want to be an American girl. Why don't you go to do typing school? The cousins and village girls are going to typing school. And you leave my sister alone. You try that with the advertising again and I'll take her with me. My telling list was scrambled out of order. When I said them out loud, I saw that some of the items were ten years old already. And I, was, I had outgrown them. But they kept pouring out anyway in the voice like Chinese opera. I could, bear the drum I could hear the drums and the cymbals and the gongs and brass horns. You're the one to leave your little sisters alone, my mother was saying. You're always leading them off somewhere. I've had to call the police twice because of you. She herself was shouting out things I had meant to tell her, that I took my brothers and sisters to explore strange people's houses, ghost children's houses, and haunted houses blackened by fire. We explored a Mexican house and a red-headed family's house, but not the gypsy's house. I had only seen the inside of the gypsy's house in mind movies. We explored the sloths where we found hobo nests. My mother must have followed us. 